My name is Jag Dougal. Twelve years ago, I was inspired by a then young senator, Barack Obama, to leave my career and go to the Harvard Kennedy School of Government to study public policy and politics. A year later, I was convinced by a friend of mine to drop out of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and join Google and move out to Silicon Valley. So I am excited to come to you here in Paris today and talk about my two great passions, the technology of big data and politics, and to do so in the Maison de la Mutualité, not, no less. That's fantastic. So thank you uh, for taking the time. Today I work for another Silicon Valley startup called Quantcast. Quantcast is a programmatic advertising technology company, but we consider ourselves a big data company first. The Quantcast measure product is now used by 100 million online destinations, both web and mobile app. Because of that massive footprint of usage by all of these publishers around the world, we have a great pulse on what people are interested in online. That data set makes Quantcast one of the top five data processing organizations in the world, along with Google, IBM, and the US Department of Defense. We use that data to try to provide the most relevant and effective advertising online. So Quantcast is a big data company focused on the online advertising space today. Quantcast, we believe that big data, this much overhyped term, is going to fundamentally transform every single industry in the global economy, as we heard this morning. Big data, the intersection of cluster computing technologies and machine learning algorithms, is going to fundamentally and radically change all of our lives. Let me give you just three examples. First, in healthcare. There is a joint institute at the University of California, San Diego, and the University of California, Irvine. Led, it's called Cal IT Squared. It's led by a gentleman named Dr. Larry Smarr. Dr. Smarr is not a medical doctor. His doctorate is in computer science. But he believes that if we can track, if we develop the sensor technologies to allow us to track 50 proteins in our bodies, as they go through 50 major organ systems in our bodies, if we have those 2,500 biomarkers in all of us across millions of people, that we will be able to understand the causality of several diseases for which we have very limited understanding today. Over the last 25 years, the world has gotten a lot wealthier. And as a result of that, infectious disease and the diseases that kill, used to kill millions of children under the age of five are now declining at an accelerating rate. That's the good news. The bad news is that so-called lifestyle diseases, diseases like coronary disease, autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease, which is a digestive ailment, uh, diseases like cancer are increasingly accounting for a higher proportion of death and illness around the world. Those diseases can be much better understood, Dr. Smarr believes, if you can track over an extended period of time across millions of people these 2,500 biomarkers. He believes that in less than a decade we will at least be able to track about 100 of them. And in doing so, we will be able to predict the causation of disease for things like Crohn's disease, for things like coronary disease, in a personalized way for each one of us, 
in a way that the diagnostic tests today simply aren't capable of. Most of the diagnostic tests for these types of diseases can only tell you after you've gotten the disease whether or not you're sick. Imagine a world where you could predict that you will get sick unless you take some treatment path. Big data is going to fundamentally transform healthcare over the next 10 years. Let me give you another example. There are two former Google data scientists. They happen to be headquartered in the same building that Quancast is headquartered in in San Francisco. They know nothing about agriculture. But what they did is they formed a company called the Climate Corporation. And they have gathered data from the US Department of Agriculture on all of the rainfall patterns, all of the soil characteristics, and all of the crop yields for every single farm in America over the last 75 years. Why is that useful? That data allows them to understand and predict with far greater accuracy what the crop yield is going to be for any single farmer in the United States. How do they make money? They can predict crop yields better than the insurance companies that have been in that business for 100 years. The company was recently bought about two years ago for over a billion dollars. Now let's get to the topic at hand. Let's talk about politics. The 2012 US presidential campaign will be studied by political scientists in the same way that the 1960 Kennedy-Nixon campaign has been studied for the last 50 years. The Kennedy-Nixon campaign introduced television to major political campaigns. The 2012 campaign introduced big data to politics, and it will never be the same. On November 6, 2012, Mitt Romney woke up, that's US election day, Mitt Romney woke up convinced he would be president. So much so that the campaign famously didn't bother to write a concession speech. So on the day of the election, they made the wrong prediction. The Obama campaign, by contrast, 12 weeks before election day, knew that they were going to win Hamilton County, Ohio, with 56% of the vote. Actually, to be precise, 56.68% of the vote. Hamilton County, Ohio, I assume no one in Paris knows where Hamilton County, Ohio is. Hamilton County, Ohio is the county in and around Cincinnati, Ohio. It's where Procter & Gamble is headquartered. Hamilton County, Ohio is the swing county in Ohio the swing state in the US Electoral College. What that means is, if you know you're going to win Hamilton County, you know you're going to win Ohio. If you know you're going to win Ohio, you know you're going to win Virginia, Colorado, and Florida. If you know you're going to win Virginia, Virginia, Colorado, and Florida, you know you're going to be President of the United States. Twelve weeks before the conventions, before the debates, and well before Election Day, the Obama campaign, despite the breathless press coverage, knew they were going to win. This is not a story about Republican versus Democrat. This is a story about small data versus big data. The Romney campaign used polls. Polls sample here in France and in the United States. They sample 1,000 people, and they project the behavior of those 1,000 people, in the US case, on 137 million voters. The Obama campaign is the first billion dollar campaign in US political history, actually in human history. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars recruiting people out of Silicon Valley and setting up call centers throughout the US Midwest. Instead of relying on 1,000 people every two weeks, they made 9,000 phone calls every night for 150 days. Small data, big data. It turns out that the Obama campaign 
won Hamilton County with 56.16% of the vote. And of course, he's wrapping up his second term. It is not a coincidence that in the UK election last year, both Labour and the Tories had senior leaders from the Obama campaign advising them. The political leaders here in France for 2017 would be well advised to follow uh, some of the same pathway. We believe that the big data revolution is going to be larger than the original internet revolution. Think about the last 20 years. This is a Time Magazine cover from 1996. It's the first time the inter internet ever made the cover of Time Magazine. That's Mark Andreessen. Today he is the leading venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. Back in 1996, he had just IPO'd Netscape, having invented the web browser that we all now use. In 1996, when this was the cover, Jeff Bezos had founded Amazon 12 months earlier. He had quit his investment banking job and driven across the country from New York to Seattle. Larry and Sergey were just getting to know each other on the campus of Stanford. And Mark Zuckerberg was in elementary school. Think about the last 20 years and how Amazon, Google, Facebook have transformed our lives. The next 20 years, we will see the same cycle of building great, world-changing companies on the back of big data technology. And the epicenter of this big data revolution is actually where all of us work. It's in online media and advertising. 30 years ago, anyone in a major western city had access to about three or four television stations, one or two major metropolitan newspapers, and eight to 10 radio stations. We had access to about a dozen media choices broadcast to all of us. Today, there are three billion people online. Each of us, in our Twitter feed, in our Facebook feed, in our browsing path through the internet, we all have the equivalent of a personalized station for each of us. Today, there aren't a dozen choices. There are three billion personalized choices. The technology to make that happen, Hadoop, MapReduce, Quantcast file system, these are being pioneered in the online media and advertising space. They're going to be used in every industry over the next three, five, seven years. So now let's talk about Hillary and the Donald. We were curious a couple of months ago about what patterns the Quantcast measure data set would allow us to, to see beyond the polling that we all hear about on the television. First, let's look at the industries where, that are showing the greatest interest, first uh, in Hillary Clinton and the Democratic campaign. Media and the internet, number one. You know, the Republicans in the US complain frequently that the US media is way too liberal. Our data confirms that they might have a bit, of a, a bit of a case. Telecommunications and insurance. Now let's look at the Trump and Republican side. The military is the highest indexing support, base of support for Donald Trump. Retail, people who work in retail stores. And also, given a very polarized media environment in the US, media and internet. Now let's look at what Clinton supporters are interested in online and what they're searching for. These are serious people. They're interested in global news. They're interested in government. They're interested in finance. And they're also interested in sports. Now let's look at the Trump interests. Number one, highest indexing, video games, shopping, entertainment news, and also, of course, this is the party of business, so business news as well. Now let's look at what television shows the Hillary Clinton uh, and Democratic supporters are most interested in. And I'll just highlight the, 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 the large picture. I know Madam Secretary is not well watched here in, in France, so I'll give you a quick synopsis. 
It is the story of a dashing and entrepreneurial female Secretary of State who goes on in season two to serve as President of the United States. In other words, it is the story Hillary Clinton is hoping to write. It is now in its third season, and the Democrats really like it. Let's look at the television shows on the Republican side and for Trump. Scandal, which I know is well, well watched here. America's Next Top Model. And Professional Wrestling. There's a joke in there somewhere, but I'm just here to present data. Now let's look at the issue profile for uh, this election. The two issues on the left, abortion politics and defunding Planned Parenthood, and a, the latest of the Clinton scandals we've been living it for 25 years, the email scandal, these are classic Republican Democratic issues. We've all lived it for 25 years. And what you'll notice is they motivate the base Republican and Democratic equally. They do a very specific job. They make Republicans vote for Republicans, and they make Democrats, Democrats vote for Democrats in about equal measure. They basically fight to a stalemate. The two issues on the right, banning Muslim entry into the United States, at least on a temporary basis, and building a wall on the Mexican border, these are the signature unique issues of Do that Donald Trump has brought into the campaign. And this is where we found something very surprising. They actually do not motivate Republicans to an especially high degree. What they do is they motivate the Democrats against the Republicans on these two issues. And this is the first sign of trouble for the Republican campaign in the autumn. Let's deep dive into a couple of them. Defunding Planned Parenthood, as I said, it motivates both sides just about equally. You will notice that Democratic women are highly motivated by this, camp, by this uh, issue, and Republican men. So there is a gender symmetry here. And you'll notice that both on the Democratic and the Republican side, it's the middle-aged and older voters who are motivated by this issue. This has been a fault line culture war issue for 30 years. The, the younger voters don't care nearly as much about it. Let's look at the banning of Muslims uh, issue. Again, much more motivating to Democrats. And this is what's most interesting. It motivates Democrats across all ethnic uh, lines. I know in France you don't track uh, ethnic groupings in the US, we do, both for the same reason, to try to drive equality. Um, but all ethnic groups are equally motivated, but here's the key point. It's the young voters who are motivated. In other words, Hillary Clinton, who even this week is struggling to pull together the Bernie Sanders voter, the core Obama voter of the last eight years, this is the issue that will motivate them to vote for Hillary when push comes to shove. This is the issue that gets the Obama coalition to join the Hillary Coalition. Now let's tr transition to French politics. And here I have to admit, I am much less into my uh, area of expertise. I should also tell you that it's very early in the French political cycle for 2017. So this is research that we will be continuing over the next several months and into next year. But there are some interesting findings here. First, on the Parti Socialiste. Clearly, the party uh, gets the, uh, a, a, an over-index of its support from, from women. What's interesting is that Emmanuel Macron, undeclared uh, challenger, um, gets an even higher index of support amongst women than, uh, than President Hollande. It's interesting to see such a young candidate as Emmanuel Macron uh, under-index relative to President Hollande uh, amongst young voters. It'll be interesting to see if that trend continues or if it changes should the campaign on the primary side continue. You can see that Macron highly indexes for graduate school, Hollande sort of the opposite in terms of education and revenue uh, and uh, income as you would expect uh, correlating with that education. 
Now let's look at the Republicans. Alain Juppé and Nicolas Sarkozy. Again, the entire conservative side indexes much higher amongst men than amongst uh, women. What is interesting is, as I understand it, there have been questions about Juppé and age and, and all of that. You can see that he has an argument based on the online data anyway, that he attracts actually a younger base of interest than, pre than former President Sarkozy. Uh, and you can see that uh, Sarkozy has the wealthy amongst the French population um, most uh, in his support. So that's a little bit of what we can say about the emerging French pattern of the election. It's obviously very early and we'll look into issues over time as we, as we get closer to elections. In closing, I want to bring us back to the fact that big data is going to change every global industry. The industry that most of us in this room are a part of is online media and advertising. We have not seen a change in our industry like this since the early 1950s. It's been almost 70 years. That was the transition from radio to television. And I think there are lessons to be learned from that transition. Scheduled television in the United States started in 1947. But the rules of television weren't figured out until 1951, 52, 53 when a woman named Lucille Ball, pictured here, started the first scheduled situation comedy for 30 minutes called I Love Lucy. She was a revolutionary. In the early 1950s, she was gonna be a star of the show who was a woman. Not only was she a woman, she was a redhead. And a year into her television program, she got pregnant. She was a revolutionary. The only sponsor they could find for I Love Lucy was for a pregnant woman was a cigarette company. That's how radical the concept was when it launched. At the time, every television show in the United States was broadcast live from New York. Any mistakes made were broadcast live to tens of millions of people. You had only one camera because people didn't know any better. And there were, if for comedies, there was a canned automatic laugh track. Lucy lived in Los Angeles, and she didn't want to move, which meant that they couldn't broadcast live. So they recorded to tape. She had come from the movie industry, so she had Hollywood directors direct episodes. And they could not live with one camera, so they had three. And Lucy insisted on a live audience as a great comedian. If you look at any situation comedy today, in France, in the UK, in the US, three cameras record to tape, live audience. The rules of television were written in a five year period in the early 1950s, and we are living by them now, 70 years later. In big data and programmatic advertising, the rules of advertising are going to be rewritten five years into programmatic, 2016, over the next five years. We are fortunate to be present at the creation. We get to write the rules. The rules on targeting, the rules on creative, the rules on media, the rules most importantly on attribution. Let's write them well, because they will be with us for our grandkids. Thank you, Jack. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It was very original and very interesting. Thank